This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. But Patrick, what I can predict in the short term is our post-game chart book. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your research roundup email. If you don't have a research roundup email, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com. Click the red button that says looking for the downloads. S&P futures, page two. Boy, Patrick, look at that candle with the red circle around it where we had the vaccine news. Oh, that's for sure. Like, I, I actually want to look beyond this in a moment. Uh, it really, I uh, just wanted to give us a reference point, but it was one big breakout attempt on the S&P 500 that was almost immediately sold into. And uh, we haven't really begun uh, any meaningful market correction, at least not yet, because, I mean, a, a correction that, uh, would have us already back down toward 3,400, and we're just not seeing that yet. So, you know, I don't want to already imply anything bearish, but certainly Certainly, uh, one of the things that I would have been looking for from a, a news event like this is whether or not it would trigger a feedback loop of, of buying and that would cause the market to just keep being up every single day, very similar to what we saw in the summer in August. And we're just not seeing that yet. And so it will be really interesting to see how it plays out. But really what I want to talk about is on page three, which is uh, where we have the Russell versus the NASDAQ. And this is one of the most fascinating things that happened on the vaccine news, which is essentially this idea that the economy could recover and certainly could uh, spur inflation risks and all sorts of different variables. And what's interesting is, is that when we're looking on the left-hand side, we can see that the NASDAQ on that news almost immediately started to sell while the Russell went screaming higher. And literally, they went in opposite directions. And I thought that was quite significant that that was playing out that way. And we still have since that news event that the NASDAQ is more or less underwater from at least it's not up uh, since the news event. And the Russell, though, has been holding up. And that asks that question on the right hand side. Have we seen that trend shift that's been in place for years. For years, we've had a material outperformance of the NASDAQ and the FANG stocks over that of the small cap Russell. And it's not just been a 2020 event in this uh, you know, coronavirus period. We've seen that trend in place for many, many years. And there was inevitably was going to come a point where that trend was going to shift and small caps and international stocks may start to outperform. Now, one day or one week doesn't make a new trend, but uh, technically we've had a substantial basing throughout much of this year on the, uh, the, the Russell over the NASDAQ chart. And uh, it's just an interesting question to ask as to whether or not this is the beginning of a breakout here. Well, Patrick, it seems like that underperformance is on the NASDAQ, which I assume is mostly being driven by the FANG Plus stocks. Let's look at page four where you've got the FANG Plus index. You know, this seems to me like uh, sideways consolidation didn't get the the new all-time high test like we saw on the S&P. What do you interpret out of this chart? Well, let's see, I, I would even go and look underneath the surface while I don't have the charts up here. What is interesting is substantial breakdowns in the last week or two on everything from Facebook to Amazon to Netflix. Microsoft has been somewhat weak. Twitter has broken down a lot. The only one of the FANG stocks that actually continues to have a very clean trend and positive price action has to be Google. And that's the, like the last uh, one of the FANG stocks standing from in terms of that. And uh, so really, this is something I'm watching because really we've seen this period where this index was the leadership. And it's going to be really interesting to see whether that baton is passed and whether other parts of the market start to outperform. And even if this does, this doesn't, sector doesn't have to necessarily crash, but will it underperform? And will that not be where the money is flowing is one of the more interesting things to, to kind of find out in the coming weeks as, as we see how this develops into the new year. 
So what I wanted to, though, move on here is to page five, where we have the euro stock. And what's fascinating here is that even before the vaccine news came out, but the vaccine news gave it an extra boost, we have just seen a huge rip higher in the euro stock, up 20% in just two weeks. It's just been screaming higher, but more importantly, it has now exceeded all of the summer highs. One of the characteristics that we've seen in the euro stock was that it was just dragging. And while the uh, US equity markets kept plugging higher and higher, the euro stock was just dead money and just couldn't get off of the mat. And with this big rally higher, the question is, are we seeing a shift where global developed markets can actually outperform the U.S. equity markets? Maybe that's a, a correlated to the Russell as well. And what we can see if we go to page six was where the Japanese Nikkei as well in the last two weeks has just had an extraordinary breakout, finally breaking out of those January, February highs and it just doing doing so with a great momentum. And it's going to be really interesting to see whether or not these international markets can actually continue to outperform in the coming weeks. So Eric, let's move on to crude oil here. And so we're looking at the December contract. And one of the interesting things is how strong this recovery has been in the last two weeks off that low. At the late October, early November, we were establishing a low down in the Fibonacci zones uh, around the 34 handle. And since then, we go screaming higher, consolidating well above the, those highs of September and October. And it's just a what a quick flip. And it really asked the question, was this a meaningful Meaningful shift in the oil markets, and and how does this play out from here? What's your take on this? Well, Patrick, it's really really interesting because if I look at what I see on this chart, it really does look like the long-awaited breakout is perhaps finally starting. I've been saying all summer long that I, I thought basically, okay, we had that really big move up off of the. April lows, then we've been consolidating. And I, I really think at some point, we're going to see another significant move up to sustain prices above $50 a barrel. And eventually, not immediately, but I'd say by the end of 2021, I wouldn't be surprised if we're in the $75 plus range. And the reason is, we will have destroyed so much supply capacity and when demand comes back and it's certainly not right now but eventually you know there really is going to be a resolution to the pandemic and the economy will be reopened and travel will be happening again when all those things happen we're not going to be able to produce the oil that we need to keep up with it and prices are going through the roof and uh, i thought okay maybe finally the market is starting to to sniff this out but if i look at the news flow what really is happening, regardless of the Pfizer vaccine news, which frankly is mostly hype and hoopla as far as I'm concerned, the real news here is we've got a parabolic rise in both new cases, new infections, and in deaths. And at the same time, we've also got this mink strain news, which could have very negative consequences in terms of prolonging the COVID-19 crisis longer than anybody expected. So I would have expected this news flow to give us one last a test of the the bottom of the lows and we're we're seeing a test of the high end of the range instead it really doesn't make sense to me maybe it's just time that uh, th this rally is ready to move on in anticipation of that decline in U.S. production capability that Art Berman is still projecting at the end of this quarter and into next year. It's hard to say. I, I really am surprised that we're seeing this much strength on this particular news flow right now. You know, one of the things I'm going to be watching is actually how well the bulls defend it, right? Because if we find that by Monday or Tuesday, crude oil's back below 38, then it could make it that just like how we saw in the stock market, it could have just been everyone getting a little too excited too quickly. And then some uh, smart money comes in there and starts to distribute into it. But uh, if if we see that the price action holds up in the 40s and, and really consolidates up here, that would uh, demonstrate that it's 
not only uh, got up to this price levels, but it's actually being well defended up here. And that would be something that would be very impressive by, if by next week when we're doing the show, if we saw prices hold up there. But what I wanted to touch on on page eight was uh, touching on the energy equities. And so here I have the Spider Energy ETF, which is the symbol XLE. And those energy stocks had a 20% update, just went screaming higher. And what's interesting about this is that the energy stocks in many ways were throughout the summer predicting that oil was going to stay weak in a sense that the, they were very well distributed. There, there was no follow through to any rallies and they just kept selling and selling even though oil was holding up. And what's interesting here is that we, for the first time, we've seen this space come to life. And I'm going to be very curious to see whether this is an indication that equity investors in this space are actually seeing a light at the end of the tunnel and, and starting to, uh, to accumulate this space. A few days don't make a new trend. I don't want to get overexcited too quickly, but it is certainly something that's uh, important to watch. So Eric, moving on, I want to just touch on uranium briefly. What is interesting is, is that after several months of consolidation, here I have the chart of the North Shore Global Uranium Mining ETF, the URNM. And what's interesting is, is that we're fi seeing some breakout attempts on the upside after some consolidation. What will be really interesting to see is whether or not this buying follows through north of 30. And that's uh, something I think we're going to keep a close eye on going into next week. Yeah, I bought both URNM and YCA after the uh, uranium show that we did a few weeks ago. URNM is uh, doing much better than YCA is uh, to the upside, so uh, it, it seems to be working pretty well. But I saw also, and I don't have much detail on this, we'll try to get more for you next week, but I think one of the things that we lamented on on that show is how ridiculous is it that the United States doesn't have some kind of strategic reserve for uranium to you know to keep uranium on hand so that it, we could supply our nuclear power industry if the global supply chains were ever cut off due to political crisis it sounds like there's now a budget from the senate that's been proposed i don't know whether this is a done deal or just somebody's proposal but maybe they're listening to macro voices i don't know it sounds like maybe they're going to create a strategic uranium reserve similar to the strategic petroleum reserve certainly i think it's overdue we'll, we'll try to get more information on that before next week's show all right well let's move on to page 10 and i just wanted to illustrate that support line on gold that we have approached i mean in that one fluid motion on that reaction earlier this week we came right back to those september october lows and this is such a critical moment because in my mind if gold can't recover back to let's say 1920 in the coming week uh, and the price action stays down here it's like a little bit of an edge of a uh, of a cliff and if we see that price action breaking below there then and this consolidation may head down south of 1800. Now, I'm not in any way big picture bearish, and that probably would lead to a buying opportunity if it did. But uh, watching how it reacts along the support line is definitely one of the key things to watch this week. Well, and the fascinating thing to me, Patrick, these are daily bars, but if you were to zoom in and look at that huge red bar on Monday, most of that happened in very, very short order on the Pfizer vaccine news. And you would think that as the stock market retraced most of its knee-jerk reaction, that the gold market would have retraced too, but gold went down and stayed down. And uh, I'm hopeful that we will get a deeper correction. I'd, I'd love to have a chance to buy some more. A couple of technical levels that I'm watching are the 200-day moving average, which is at 1798 and a half right now, uh, moving higher every day. There's also another technical level at about 1757, which was the, uh, the daily R2 resistance level. We'll see what happens here, but it's very, very curious to me that the tape action is what it is here, and the reaction to the same news event is completely different in the stock market. Right. And so the the last chart I wanted to touch on is just looking at the U.S. high yield credit spreads. And one of the most interesting things that's going on is that we continue to see yields rising on U.S. government bonds. 
So treasury bonds are very, very weak. And we've also, on investment-grade corporate bonds, seen highs all the way back in July and August. And generally, they've been treading water since. But when we go to junk bonds and all, the, all our high-yield bonds, they're making multi-month highs and pushed higher, obviously, with some correlation to the equity markets and this idea that there could be a recovery. But this has pushed the spread down toward 400 basis points. And so th this uh, junk bond market is not at all pricing in the fact that there's got to be some wave of defaults coming from this coronavirus. And even if the Fed is buying it, at what point do you price in that the Fed can't stop companies from uh, having some rise in defaults? And I asked the question, is this being priced in or is this mispriced? And I, I tend to be in the camp thinking that this is mispriced priced and considering that we're already seeing weakness broadly in the bond markets, it'll be really interesting to see where this starts to turn. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a whole new world that we live in, Patrick. It used to be that you looked at default risk objectively and that affected price. And now price maybe is affected by default risk, but probably to a greater extent, the expectation is the Fed has already bought junk bonds and will probably buy more and will probably not be that concerned about those default rates. And it might even be buying them in reaction to those defaults that you're talking about coming in order to defend or save the market from capitalism actually happening the way it's supposed to. So it's, I don't know, I don't know what's coming next, but in this world that we live in, I think anything is possible. Folks, don't forget that Patrick does webinars four days a week with uh, all of these great chart decks. You can get a free trial of his service, Big Picture Trading. Information for signing up is on page 12. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>